You've tuned into the Bellingham Podcast for the week of November 17th, 2019. This is episode 138. From that autumn city by the Salish Sea, I am AJ Barce. And pushing my spectacles firmly in place on the bridge of my nose, I am Chris Powell. On this episode, hey, got a what if scenario for you. What if some horrible, dastardly, diabolical villain, no, I'm not talking about AJ this time, made it impossible for you to use anything related to Google in your online life? Would you weep uncontrollably? Would you throw your phone in the river? Would you just simply post an angry tweet about it? Or would you be like me and find a way? I'll share some alternatives to the Google life. And AJ and I will share some cultural recommendations as we approach the Thanksgiving holiday coming up on the Bellingham Podcast. You know, we must find the moose and the squirrel. How are you doing, Chris? I am doing just fine, comrade. It's <laughs> wonderful to see you again. Anyway, yes. <laughs> uh, when, in between uh, 137 and this episode, you, AJ, my friend, have been on the road yeah. going to some conferences. Yeah, yeah. So I, I've been doing the, the tech, it's con- tech conference season. So I've, I, I, I've been here between here and uh, Portland. So I've been staying in the Pacific Northwest, thank heavens. And dealing with Interstate 5, I oh, would imagine. Don't get me started. Actually, I went through so uh in seattle we have yes. a new tunnel that opened uh, opened up and stuff a okay. while back we had you know there was uh what was big that machine bertha. big bertha yeah, yeah. the big drill right uh-huh uh well at the time of this recording there is now a, a fee you have to have a good to go pass here in the state of washington right. to go through it uh i um had some meetups that i was able to do uh while i was out at conference one of them when i was staying in seattle I had to go to West Seattle to say hello to uh, Mike, one half of the Two Broke Watch Snobs podcast. Hello, Mike. Yeah. So we uh, met up and we uh, shared some watches and stuff, which was really cool. But I got to go through the tunnel. Ah, uh, yes. And I hadn't, I hadn't done that, you know. Since and how's the tunnel? It's very tunnel uh, Did you honk your horn through the duration of the tunnel like some cars do? Oh, I was out of frustration because it took me some 40 minutes to go from one side of Seattle to the other. Keep but it clean. Keep I it clean. I did. All right. I did. But no, uh, something that I noticed on the tunnel as you're driving and you look over to the, the right, you know, it shows like the evacuation emergency exits and stuff. And there's like, I'll call it the portal logo. That's a gamer reference okay. of the little portal guy. And it shows you an arrow left and right that shows you how many feet it is to the exit. Oh. And there's staggered exits so that if you are ever in a car accident there or if you needed to evacuate said tunnel because of a zombie apocalypse sure. or the subduction zone, whatever. In happens, other words, Thursday. Sure. It shows you which direction to go. And I, I just I hadn't seen that before. Yeah, yeah. It was just, just interesting. Welcome to the future of tunnels. Exactly. All right. It's a big like hole it. in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Along those lines, let's bury our, our show even more. So, so yeah. So I, I sup Mike. Uh, met met up with him over in uh, West Seattle, which was cool. Uh, then I was in Portland for a little bit, and uh, also met up with one half of Forty and Twenty. Hello, Forty and Twenty. Uh, so I met up with Everett, ah, and yes. uh, he kind of showed me a little bit of the the, the downtown uh, Portlandia. Awesome. Met up for drinks and and shared some watch stories and stuff, which was really cool. Because you got to bear in mind, like both these guys. I mean, I hear on the mic every week, no differently than us, and I've chatted with them for I don't know how long through you know, instant messenger and whatever, uh-huh. but it was really kind of cool being face to face. It was kind of fun. It's very important, kind of how we are recording this episode now face to face. But it's wonderful to be able to uh, get to ha- hang out with the watch fam yeah. in live and living color, if you will. It was, it was. So cheers, guys. Cool. But along those same lines, if you're not face to face like Chris Powell and myself are, you might be listening to us on KMRE 102.3 FM. They're streaming worldwide at KMRE.org on your web browser of choice. Hopefully it's not the... Oh, wait, I can't. I don't want to throw them under the bus this episode. Or streaming on KMRE.org. There you go. Sounds good. Shall we, shall we dive in, Chris Hunt? <laughs> then, no, no relation to Ethan do, Hunt. Do, yes. Do, 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 Good morning, Mr. Do, Powell. Do, do, your mission, should you choose to accept do, do, it, do, is to not use Google at all in your online do, life. Do, 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 this computer will self destruct in five seconds, as will my ears from listening to that theme. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, every now and then I want to be able to do some uh, self challenges in my technological life as I'm looking at a screen for the better part of a day. Uh, way back y- in yesteryear, I tried to be able to not use a mouse 
while uh, on my Windows computer for an entire workday. Really? When was this? Uh, this was back around the late 90s, early 2000s. Wow. So uh, ask me how long I lasted. Uh, how many keystrokes? Uh, I, well, I got the keystrokes down. It was okay. a lot of control, alt, uh, uh, shift, control, uh, keystrokes to be able to navigate Windows without the mouse. But I only... <clears throat> was able to last about three hours. Three hours. Three hours before I'm like, I can't get any work done. <laughs> I needs me mouse anyway. Along huh. these lines, uh, you know, can I use a Linux computer for a work day to be able to do what I need to do? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, evolution yes. email yeah. to try to get into Outlook, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's these challenges. Well, my latest challenge that I've been working on. For quite some time, folks, I would know. Oh, yes. But uh, to try to not... Use anything Google related. Yeah, this this is where you and I are going to definitely diverge here. Oh or, yeah. Or, yeah, that's fine. Well, you know, uh, while Google has uh, created a, a world class secure product, sure, I got a problem with their privacy and, and the some data, of the business practices and business Full practices. Disclosure, you and I both have those problems. Oh yeah, and as far as the data collection that they have, yes, uh, on. Hundreds of millions of people. Dare we venture billions? Well, they, I think they have bigger market cap, uh, at least in mobile over iOS. Correct? Sure. Yeah, I yeah. would imagine so, especially with their oper- Android operating Android system. Android operating system. So, yeah. with that in mind, I I asked myself, how can I be online without using anything that is connected to Google? Okay. Which is a really tough challenge. <laughs> Which also at the top of the show, just to remind everybody uh, who are listening, Chris and I both record this show on two Apple iPhones. So like right. Android is not something that we typically do, but you and I definitely use it fairly regularly. I have an Android phone for development purposes. Yeah, same here. Yeah. Uh, but as far as what we use, it's an iPhone yeah. and therefore there isn't anything. Well, the reason why I was saying that is at least there's one layer, like they're, yeah. we are not in their operating system. So you're already one layer removed as opposed to some of our listeners because True. I see our stats and there are some Android listeners, sub Android listeners. And we're happy that you're listening to us on your Android podcast of choice. But... Should you want, you know, there's a Google search. It's a verb. It is a, yeah, to Google something. Exactly. And and go on with Google, go on with your Google self. But wait, wait, shouldn't we just Yahoo things? No, stop Yahoo that. did a rebrand. Stop they it. They just launched. Just, AJ. Again. Don't make me. Okay. No, stop it. It's an alternative. It's an alternative, but I actually want to do something that I could get success with. Fine. Uh, should you not want to use Google.com for searching the web for whatever research you are researching? Uh, consider, you know, DuckDuckGo is something that's been around for a while, DuckDuckGo.com. But I discovered something that's pretty uh, secure because that, you know, really rings a bell and resonates with me. There's a web page, a search engine out there called private.sh. Shh. I, let me say it again. Private.sh. Private.sh. Yes. Okay, we, they get the point. <laughs> um, this is this is a pr- new private search engine that uses cryptography, thank you very much, to ensure that your search history cannot be tracked by anyone, including the creators and developers of that search engine, Private Internet Access, which is a VPN company that I've actually paid money to use. Okay. It's a private search engine. Therefore, your search results, if I'm going to look for a gift for my daughter uh, for her birthday or for Christmas coming up, I'm not going to have Google track uh, what would we be doing now? Victoria's Secret, Forever 21, if Ugg they're boots. still open. Ugg boots. Uh, it's more like DC shoes or, or Converse Chuck Taylors. But I don't want that being associated with me in my Google search results. Check out private.sh. Now, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, some of these websites that I'm going to be talking about don't have a .com. Don't put a .com after some of these. We're in a new Good era point. of top-level domains. TLDs. Yes, TLDs. Uh, the .sh. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> is actually the uh, replacement for a .com. It still is a valid site. So uh, that is for the big old Google search. Now, there's a web browser that Google makes called Google Chrome. Or Chromium. Or Chromium. I know it well. Should you not want to use anything Google-related, I often use Mozilla Firefox, which so is an I. open source browser created by the Mozilla Foundation. Who's been around since Mosaic. Right. And that would be the mid-90s, if I recall correctly. 
Uh, early to midnight. Yes. Yeah. Uh, because I remember when I was in my undergrad days, I was using NCSA Mosaic, which was a way prehistoric web browser. So Okay, we just nerded a little bit too hard there. Of course, because this is a tech episode. <laughs> anyway, Mozilla Firefox is a great web browser. Now, there's always something cool about Apple Safari, and yeah. and uh, there are some other web browsers like Brave. Yeah, Brave, Opera. Yes, but I don't want to have anything to do with Google, and I know that Mozilla Firefox doesn't have anything to do with Google. Ah, but it's now built off of the Chromium backend. It, it is now, huh? Yes. Well, uh, I guess then I would have to just be able to enclose but, a self-addressed stamped envelope to my searching for information. But here's the difference, though. I mean, if you're using something that is built off of Chromium, Chromium is the open source code product that makes Chrome. The difference is, is that with Firefox, the Google services side, which I think is the part that you're kind of dis- yeah. have a discrepancy with, it's not when you use Chrome, everything stays in the Chrome browser and then fed up to a Google Gmail account. And that's where you get that that enclave of treasure trove data ness that you don't yes. want a boost to show up with firefox you can sign in with a firefox account you can sign in with nothing if you yeah, want which i don't and the, the just because it's built in chromium doesn't mean that it is a google google product it's just you're using the code base that is google along with firefox i have about eight add-ons or extensions uh, to improve my privacy and or security such as cookie auto delete decentralize mm. uBlock origin yeah origin. https everywhere privacy badger enhancer for youtube hold that thought and uh to be able to have a couple of these and multi-account containers containers is what i was just gonna say uh, of course because i want to have my web browsing not be accessible for others to be able to uh learn about my habits if everyone, uh, whenever I ask a group of people, how many of you have a Gmail email account as a personal account? Hands fly up in the air. You should do the opposite. How many of you don't have a Gmail account? How many of you don't, right? Exactly. There's still a couple left, but a Gmail account is almost ubiquitous in this current era. Yeah. To not have a Google Mail account, you have some alternatives. But I had to have a layer of protection because I don't want this owned by some multinational company. Sure. Such as, well, I don't know if Comcast is a multinational company, but Comcast Mail, Microsoft Outlook.com, AOL. There are still folks who have AOL.com uh, mails, and we love them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And Yahoo is still out there. But there is a company in Switzerland called Proton Mail. ProtonMail.com. Got a link to it in the show notes. For the love of Nikita Koloff. Drink. That's right. Uh, they are secure, encrypted, and in case the United States government has a vendetta against me. And your email. Uh, and my email, and they want to get access to my email, they they can go over to uh, Switzerland and go, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Proton Mail, give me all the <laughs> records on uh, Chris. And they won't have anything to give them because they don't, they have uh, uh, no logs uh, policy. So another country, they won't be able to have that mm. uh, access delivering for me. But and I think we're going to revisit this, but that does not apply to necessarily the, the tunnel, the connection to which you get to your email unless you have a secure tunnel. Correct. We'll get to that later. We'll get to that later. Uh, but but along the lines with Google Mail, you also have Google Calendar, which is rather ubiquitous for so many people. Yeah, totally. I don't have a solution at this point for a non-Google calendar. Really? So I've made the decision to use my work calendar, which which is Outlook, yeah, yeah. as my at work and not at work uh, scheduler. Riddle me this. why? Because I happen to know you and your family are on the iOS ecosystem. Why don't you use uh, Apple's iCloud calendar service? I don't really uh, like, I, I really don't like Apple's calendar app, their default Just, app. Uh, okay. And I found that inviting my wife, who sure. is on a Google calendar account, it's a lot easier for me to use Fantastical, sure. which is an app on the iOS and the Mac OS ecosphere, which has wonderful natural language scheduling of uh, dates. I just never really got into Apple Mail. Okay. And uh, also I wanted to be, and, and back in those days, uh, it was really difficult to get access to Apple Mail from a Windows computer or from a Linux computer. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's pretty much a moot point because I, I do it fairly regularly for I, for for email mm-hmm. and for, for the actual, I, use, I keep wanting to call it iCal because for years that's what sure. it was called, but Apple Calendar. Because, uh, I mean, that's typically what I use. And you can access it web, you can yes. do it Mac, PC, whatever. 
I made the decision to try to eliminate a little bit of complexity in my life because I used to have work is in Outlook and and non work is in Google Calendar. Is your wife's G the G is it a G Suite for work or yes? Ah, okay, got Uh it. Uh huh. Got it. So anyway, (laughs) no, no, no. I just that was the missing piece. I got you. But coming soon, from what I've heard, a company that makes Proton Mail is also coming out with a Proton Calendar and perhaps in sometime in 2020 a Proton Drive. (gasps) Oh. Boy, uh, to have that company provide secure encrypted features. Yeah. T- shut up and take my money. <laughs> sure. So speaking of money, to shut up and take your money. I mean, Proton Mail, the Proton service, we'll just yes. call it that. Uh, they do have a free account, but it's pretty rudimentary. What is the cost for the basic uh, program for it? If you, if you want to check it out, protonmail.com, uh, 500 gigabytes with a free account. Okay. If you want to go up to the plus account, it's about maybe I usually throw them about 50 bucks a year. Sure. Or you can do what is it? Five bucks a month. Or if you pay, you get a discount if you pay the annual thump. Right. right. Uh, And with that, I'm allowed to have a bunch of alias accounts. Mm. I think five. I can take a domain uh, for my uh, personal domains that I own and I can have that forward to my Proton login. Which is all in one. Yeah. yeah. uh, And they got it and they have. Let's get the correct grammar. They have a Really nice uh, app for iOS and Android. The, uh, the iOS app just went open source recently, which is nice. Cool. And the web interface is is fairly uh, robust. It's not up to the level of the Google because you have thousands of developers on the okay. Gmail interface that changes every six is, months. Is that, okay, I'm glad you mentioned that because that, yeah. that was going to be my biggest gripe is I – I personally do not like the Gmail web interface. Yeah. Full stop. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's clunky. It is well past its its due date. And you're right. They have been moving features or moving out features at nine times. That, I mean, you teach Google Essentials. I teach Google Mail and Google and Calendar be because frustrated as all get out. I'm doing just great because I'm well, rather okay, fl- yes. I, I'm malleable <laughs> enough to understand the changes they're making and figure it out. It's the people that sign That's up for my I mean. classes. Yeah, I know. yeah. I mean, you're you're freelance in your classes. I'm just saying. Yeah. Like, I mean, okay. Let me rephrase. It must be frustrating as an educator with a Google Essentials, and then you have your curriculum, mm-hmm. and I know this has happened to you, Chris. Yep. You will the night of your class, you will come <laughs> to me, and you're like, you'll not believe, and I'm like, yeah, I I, I saw the press release too, uh-huh. and you have to shift your curriculum like on that, the fly that mm. but anyway um yeah google has a certain type of feature set that most people are not used to and they're making assumptions about what everyone would want yeah um however in this thought exercise i'm not using google and so okay. in, we'll leave the calendar kind of as a, a, a bookmark for google docs which is a word processing collaborator how yes. would one be able to do something like this now we do our show notes yes, in quip.com which brought to you by the original team of google docs when they splintered off yes who have recently been uh acquired by salesforce, salesforce. Yes. yes so it's a great product it's a cool web interface but i wanted to go one step further because this is for all all the privacy and security folks out there, what's up, OSINT crew? Uh, <laughs> I discovered a website called crypt.ee. So remember those dot com things? It's a thing of the past. Crypt, C R Y P T, dot ee. Crypty is a free, try it out, uh, service. You get about 10 megabytes of space. Okay, for docs, that's actually, you know. For a, word, for a document that doesn't have a huge amount of graphics yeah. or audio or video. Text. You can get a decent amount of notes going on in there. Sure, uh, I, it, it uses Markdown. It has Great. a very nice web interface. And what I like about it is it's cross-platform. And so I don't use Windows if at all possible. I will use a Mac computer at work. But I'm really wanting to get more into Linux. I've been uh, headed in that direction. Sure. With a web browser such as Firefox, which comes built into most Linux distros, Crypty's right there for me. The interface looks great. The font looks pleasing. Mm -hmm. And, oh, I can uh, have this available on my iOS device by going to crypt.ee and then adding that site to, uh, to my home screen. Okay. So therefore, so it's like a web app app. A web app app. And it has a nice little logo for it. And so I'm thinking, can I go uh, migrate my Apple Notes, all 700 plus of them, into Crypty and maybe kick it up to a, a it would be, I think it's a 10 gigabyte. Uh, yeah, 10 gigabytes for about three bucks a month. 
Okay. Good way to be able to store some uh, data and other the backup for photos. It has a nice way of hosting your photos too. But again, like you're, you're starting to, to, every time we do something short of maybe Firefox, when we talked about mm-hmm. it, every time we mention something, there is a cost. Yes. Why is that, Chris? Well, I, with, What's the crux of this whole thing? I don't want to use that idiom that if you, if you're using something free, you are the product. That's been said many times. But that's kind of the undertone of this. It Data is. costs yes. whether you give it for free or you have to pay for it to keep it enclosed. You're correct. And so I I want to be able to put my money where my mouth is and I want to be able to pay for something of higher quality. Mm-hmm. That uh, That is an experiment. Okay, if it doesn't work out, I'll chalk that up to being a bad date expense. I had a lot of those as a bachelor <laughs> oh. before I met my wife. Uh, and, you know, 20 or 30 bucks that didn't quite work out, bad date expense. It's a learning experience. <laughs> anyway, moving on, uh, Google Sheets. I don't really use Google Sheets that much, and so I don't have a, another alternative. Quip. You, uh, Quip has sheets, spreadsheets available. Yeah, Quip. But I would rather use Excel and because Valid. that's the... So, yeah, yeah, I mean, with Excel, like Excel is, is long established that there is there are spreadsheet ninjas, for yeah. lack of better terms. Oh, yeah. You and I are, are, are pretty sharp with a lot of things, but you and I both have colleagues that they live and breathe spreadsheets and yes. formulas, pivot tables, hooking that up to databases, oh, yeah. ODBC, and all this other jazz stuff. And I applaud them. And honestly, Excel is probably the best tool if you're a power user like that. For the Ninja spreadsheet users out there, they would not be able to. Well, I don't think they would want to go to Google Sheets. No, I, I don't. The, from what I understand, and I'm, I, I do, I am not an Excel expert, nor do I put one on podcast. But from what I understand, not all of the power tools are there. Yeah, no, it's not ready for prime but time doing, in Excel land. But if you're doing basic budget keeping yes you could probably get away with quip sheets so personally if, if i had to not use google sheets no big sweat <laughs> for yeah. me to be able to do that google slides the powerpoint wannabe uh that's an easy one you can use powerpoint but here's the thing i don't want to go with microsoft because i got something better canva dot com yeah c-a-n-v-a there's a dot com that i want you to enter in there folks canva.com allows you to create some fabulous presentations with outstanding graphics yes and what i learned just recently that you can present from a web page and have it go full screen full graphics even if you have a projector with a vga connection it'll compensate uh canva is a free account however if you go 13 bucks a month you get a whole lot more uh of, of assets yeah. assets so the, the thing about canva the way that they monetize uh to, to preface is that it's the content so for instance is there one stop shop if you want to get um, if you want to use graphics legitimately, yeah. if you want to use um, uh, illustrations legitimately, sure. um, they're able to basically, you can pay by the image or you can have the premium account. I can't think of what they call their tier. And you kind of get it all kathunk, sure. like you just said. So the big one for a lot of Google people is Google Drive, yes. their online cloud storage solution. I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to kind of make this one a little quicker in my explanation. I'm a fan of Dropbox because you don't need to have a Google account to use it. You can you can have one, and you can also have a Microsoft one because it eliminates one drive and Google Drive and iCloud because you must have their account in order to use that service. Dropbox is like bring your own email account. doesn't matter. Yeah. But what I, I take it one step further for that security and privacy aspect. There's a product out there called Cryptomator.com, and what it allows you to do, it's a free download. You can create a folder on your Dropbox, attach an encryption password to it to decrypt and encrypt, throw whatever files you want in there, lock the folder, and you, even if someone goes into your Dropbox, they need that password in order to see your files. Yeah, and, and you and I have seen this time and time again where people have big burly passwords, yep. let's say. Oh, to, I got them, don't to, worry. To, to the Dropbox, right? Mm-hmm. But let's say, and, and let's say somebody gets a hold of that. Well, yep. You and I have seen this with our clients time and time again. Your tax documents go up there. Oh, yeah. So if you want to actually have a secure layer, let's say somebody does get into your Dropbox. If they don't have the key for Cryptomator, your they may have your Dropbox storage. They may be able to delete your tax documents, which go talk to your accountant if that happens. But... At least they don't have your social security, everything else yep. that goes into that All said the stuff in return. There. And oh, by the way, if you're ever going to go this route, make sure you don't forget your encryption, decryption password. Yes. The big one, the big one for Google services that I use a lot because we don't have cable TV. Oh, I see. What you're and going. I ended, uh, we, my wife and I uh, 
and stopped it, our Netflix accounts, and we oh, don't have a lot. Nope, we're not doing Netflix. So no Prime and no Netflix and no Hulu and no Hulu. So what do I watch on at my Apple TV? YouTube. That's right. So which is owned by Google. So if I don't go to YouTube.com, how can I watch my videos? Well, here's here's kind of an asterisk about the Google services. Mm-hmm. All right, there's a product called Invidious. I n v i d i o Invideo dot us. And this is a web page, a website that allows you to view YouTube videos. Yes, it's hosted on Google. And, and feel free to contact me if you want to argue that this is actually still a Google product. But the thing is, with Invidious uh, in the website, you get to watch it without the whole YouTube experience of all the recommended videos and all the tracking that Google would have for you because the, it's just simply using the YouTube's API. There's no telemetry going back to Google about me watching You're My Honey Bunch, which is an awesome uh, video up on YouTube. Check it out if you don't believe me. Uh, or if I wanted to have a desktop application on the Mac computer, there's a program called FreeTube, which is available for download from a GitHub repository. FreeTube will use the NVIDIAS API to be able to grab YouTube videos but play it in a non-YouTube window that Google won't be receiving. it. You don't need a Google account or uh, they won't be tracking your usage, mm-hmm. which is kind of cool. And if you really want to say, Chris, you can't use a Google product, fine. You can use Vimeo.com <laughs> or you can go to PeerTube.com and look on a number of distributed servers that have sure. a number of videos available. But I mean, that, that's still, that's that's Uber in the weeds, even I for always, our show. As a technologist, I have I to understand. address the worst case scenario. All right. So that's pretty much my, uh, that's pretty much my way to be able to de your life uh, should you ever want to try this challenge yourself. Dude, I've got a better way to de your life. How can you de your life? Just Rachel? tune into us on KMRE 102.3 FM. They're community powered and they air our show on Mondays at 6.30 p.m. and Thursdays at 6 o'clock p.m. We are getting close to the finish of this show. We should talk about our da 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 cultural recommendations. Yeah. Wow. You remember that from last time? Yeah. It's not, yeah, like the Technicolor yeah. Eye. It's yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. AJ, what's your cultural recommendation for <laughs> folks to check out mid-November? So I got, I got to give a shout out for this one because I, I got, I got uh, tipped off about it from one of our listeners, uh, Dan. I'll put a link in the, the show notes to his Instagram and stuff. He's part of the Watch Fam. And quite some months back, I almost want to say maybe almost a year ago, he uh, tipped me off to this book that got produced called Discovering Time. And it's basically a, I never, I never didn't get a chance to read it because I have a stack of books, see previous mm-hmm. recommendations. Yes. But it's always been on my radar to take a look at basically about a guy coming into the watch fam and kind of realizing what the hobby is about and all this other jazz. And if you're not part of the watch fam, it's also a way to kind of understand what kind of makes us tick. No pun intended. Oh, all the pun in the world. Uh, on that pun one. intended. All right. But, uh, but anyway, he also just tipped me off that there is a podcast audiobook form of it. It's on the, um, at least when I tried to find it on Pocket Cast, I couldn't get it there. So I can definitely tell you it is on the iTunes store. Sure. So I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, I'm presuming it's probably out in the other stores. I just couldn't find it at the time of this recording. But uh, anyway, if, you, if you've been listening to me and, and, and Chris about like the watch fam and what's up with these watches and things, um, I've only listened to like the first couple of episodes, which is the first couple of chapters. And it's it's pretty true to life, like kind of waking up and kind of realizing that you like horology and, and what that means and stuff. Uh, it's kind of an interesting look at, at our little uh, niche culture. So. Very cool. Very cool. What about you? Uh, for me, I, you know, as we're approaching the Thanksgiving holiday, which for some usually involves a whole lot of chaos and a whole lot of kitchen prep, there is a website called Peaceful Cuisine. Dot com And there is a YouTube channel called Peaceful Cuisine. There's a fabulous cook and actually time-lapse photographer, Mr. Barce, uh, Ryoya Takashima. Uh, konnichiwa, Ryoya. The beautiful part about Peaceful Cuisine videos on YouTube is that it is kind of an overhead shot of, of him preparing a dish. And he has all of the ingredients. It's on this beautifully uh, w- beautiful wooden counter mm-hmm. of, of prepping things but there it's it there are no vocals in a lot of them is it just like subdued music or yes okay it is quiet piano oh cool. quiet guitar it's peaceful yo and you watch and, and they, they give the little ingredients down in the lower left as far so you can follow along but just watching how the meal is created i love zoning out to this 
uh, channel and watching the videos. I can hear it in your voice what Abs- the pace is. Absolutely. But <laughs> it's about 13 minutes to watch. Uh, and it's mainly Japanese uh, inspired you know, dishes, inspired cuisine. Uh, definitely check this out on your YouTube channel. And even if you are de Google following your life, just give it a shot. <laughs> uh, but I got, I, it's a wonderful channel to be able to just enjoy the art of cooking by cool. someone that is not using a megaphone that doesn't have an explicit tag in their dialogue. Right. That is not no schlepping, headline grabbing, uh, schlepping products or yeah. doing advertorials for the new knife that is coming out on, on this or this new blender. That's uh, cool. Love peaceful cuisine. All right, we should probably stick a fork in the show. Oh, that's a good one. Yes. Giving off the, the, I, the pe- let stick a up. peaceful fork into this episode of the Bellingham Podcast. Thank you again so much for listening to us, rating us, reviewing us, wherever you like to get our podcast. Remember, I said it once and twice before, but I'll remind you again, if you are in the Bellingham area, you might be listening to us on KMRE 102.3 FM. What he said. Well, <laughs> <laughs> or on KMRE.org or in your favorite podcast app of choice. Especially. From Thankful City by the Sailor Sea, I am AJ Barce. And I'm Chris Powell, giving thanks for you for uh, tuning in on the Bellingham Podcast. Are we going to be on the mic next week? It's Thanksgiving. Uh, yes, I'm definitely thankful about that. Okay, Stay cool. tuned for some tasty uh, subject matter. Gravy. Gravy.